The flame of the gas welding torch is a familiar sight around plants like yours. It provides the intense heating needed for welding, brazing, soldering, and cutting, as well as for heating pipes and metal equipment during maintenance. There are other types of welding machinery, such as electric arc and resistance welding machines, but gas welding units like this one have two advantages that make them practical in almost any situation. These two advantages are independence and portability. Now, when we say independence, we mean that the system is self-contained. Everything needed to operate the equipment, in this case, oxygen and acetylene, is right here. You don't need electrical outlets or any other external source of power. Portability means that the unit can be easily moved to wherever you need it. It is a simple matter of wheeling it to the work site. Now, because of its independence and portability, gas welding equipment can be used almost anywhere. It's not limited by lack of electricity or space. Another thing that makes gas welding practical is that the equipment is relatively simple to operate. As we'll see, assembling the welding rig, using it, and then disassembling it are less complicated than similar procedures for other types of welding apparatus. But no matter how simple the equipment is, whenever you work with it, you're working with tremendously intense heat. This heat is required to get the job done, but it can also do a lot of damage to you and to the equipment that you're working on. The best rule is safety first. And safety begins with learning about the equipment and how to control it. In this unit, we'll be talking about the equipment used in gas welding and how it's set up. We'll take a close look at how each part of a gas welding rig works and how it's used. And throughout our discussion, we'll focus on the safety procedures and the types of safety equipment used in the gas welding process. Let's start with the purpose of gas welding equipment. Basically, the purpose of this equipment is to provide necessary heat for welding, brazing, soldering, cutting, and heating metal parts. Of course, some jobs require more heat than others. Cutting and welding, for example, demand very high temperatures. To get these high temperatures, a mixture of oxygen and acetylene is used. Since oxacetylene, as the mixture is called, provides the necessary high temperature flame. Jobs like soldering and heating metal parts usually require a lot less heat. For these uses, air drawn directly from the environment can be mixed with the acetylene. Air and acetylene produce less heat than oxacetylene does. Except for air, the gases used in gas welding are stored under high pressure in portable cylinders like these. In many cases, the cylinders are color-coded. Orange for acetylene, green for oxygen. But whether or not they're color-coded, compressed gas cylinders are always labeled. The first safety rule in gas welding is to be sure you're using the right gas for the job. Even if the bottles are color-coded, always check the labels. Another thing to remember is to handle these cylinders carefully. As strong as they seem, they aren't made for banging around or rough handling. Just having a cylinder fall over accidentally could be enough to rupture it and send it off like a rocket with enough force to break through a brick wall. Of course, these cylinders are built to withstand a certain amount of daily wear and tear. They have to meet safety standards established by the Department of Transportation. 
In addition, every cylinder has to be thoroughly inspected and tested every five years to be certain it maintains those standards. Still, like other types of equipment, pressurized gas cylinders are not built to take unnecessary abuse. So when handling them, here are a few good rules to follow. First, store compressed gas cylinders in a cool place, far away from open flame or other sources of heat. Excessive heat will expand the gas inside, increasing the pressure. If the temperature of the environment around the bottle gets high enough, the cylinder's fusible safety plug will soften and blow out, releasing the gas. The second rule is to secure all pressurized gas cylinders so that there's no chance of their falling or being knocked over. When in use, gas cylinders are always strapped or chained to their carts to prevent dangerous accidents. Sometimes, a lot of gas is needed to complete a job. This requires that several cylinders be attached to a manifold that feeds the gas from each of the cylinders through a single line. And when a setup like this is used, say, in a welding shop, the same rule holds. Always secure the cylinders to prevent their falling over. Now, the caps that you see on these cylinders are designed to protect the valve assemblies whenever the cylinders are not in use. They are not handles and should never be used for lifting or repositioning the cylinders. Treating a cap like a handle or a steering wheel might seem like a good idea at the time, but it's a terrible chance to take. Later, we'll talk more about the parts and functions of compressed gas cylinders. But while we're on the subject of safety, I want to tell you about some of the personal safety precautions that welders and their assistants follow. Remember that the purpose of the equipment we'll be looking at is to produce heat with temperatures as high as 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit or 2,800 Celsius. So when you're dealing with that much heat, you're also dealing with intense light, sparks, and splattering molten metal. The first thing you should be concerned about is your eyes. While gas welding doesn't produce the same blinding light that arc welding does, long exposure to light and heat of a gas welding unit can cause serious damage to the eyes. Now, dark lens goggles are your best protection when properly fitted to your face. They guard your eyes against not only intense light and heat, but also sparks and flying liquid metal. Even when cracking the valve on a cylinder to clean the valve and hoses, always protect your eyes. Of course, different jobs require different amounts of heat and light, and as a result, different amounts of shading in the lenses. You'll find a table of lens shading applications in your text. But you should know that for most heavy welding work, a number six or seven lens is acceptable. Now, a full face shield or helmet isn't necessary for most gas welding jobs, but it is necessary when grinding metal, which is usually a part of welding preparations. Your face and eyes are not the only parts of your body that can be injured by the heat and the heated metal. Your arms, hands, and your head also need protection. Always wear canvas or leather gloves to protect your hands. And wear a hat or skull cap to keep sparks or bits of metal out of your hair if you're welding overhead. To protect your arms and the rest of your body, long sleeve shirts and a sturdy pair of work pants should be sufficient. Avoid cuff pants and patch pockets, as well as knitted garments like sweaters. Cuffs and patch pockets have a way of collecting sparks, and knit garments are usually very flammable. Well, that covers the protection you'll need for the outside of your body. But you have to protect the inside of your body, too. You see, when metals are melted, as they are during welding, brazing, and cutting, they release gases. Some of these gases, like the zinc fumes given off by some filler rods, can be harmful. They can cause anything from nausea to much more serious and long-lasting effects. The idea, then, is to avoid breathing metal fumes. 
This means working only in areas that are well ventilated. If an area where welding is to be done is not properly ventilated, some system for venting the area and circulating the air should be installed before the welder begins work. Such a system should vent the fumes away from the work area and to the outside. So far, we've seen that gas welding involves extremely high temperatures and that these temperatures are produced by burning oxacetylene or air and acetylene. And we looked at some common sense precautions to follow when handling pressurized gas cylinders. And we've talked about ways to protect your eyes, skin, and lungs from the heat, light, and fumes that welders deal with every day. Well, after you have a chance to look over segment one of your text, have your instructor answer any questions you might have, and then we'll come back and discuss the welding rig itself. As we mentioned in the last segment, a gas welding unit like this one is self-contained, portable, and pretty simple to operate. And I might add that when properly handled, the gas welding method is very safe. In a moment, we'll look at the parts of the gas welding unit and the way the parts are assembled. But before we do, let's take a look at the welding process itself. Gas welding is a fusion welding process, that is, a gas flame is used to melt the metal surfaces to be joined. The metals become molten and flow together. Additional metal is provided by a filler rod, which also melts, filling in the space between the surfaces and fusing the two metals together into a strong bond or joint. Basically then, two metal pieces are placed close together and melted at their point of contact. The molten metal from the two pieces flows together, while additional metal is provided by melting the filler rod into the space between them. And we also mentioned that gas welding units can be used for brazing and soldering. Brazing and soldering are very similar to welding, except that only the filler is melted. The metal pieces to be joined are not heated to make them melt and flow together. In brazing and soldering then, the filler or solder form the bond between the two pieces and the strength of the filler determines the strength of the joint or bond. Now these three processes, welding, brazing, and soldering are methods for joining metal pieces together. But the same heat that fuses two metal pieces can be used to cut metal as well. The cutting process is done like this. The torch flame is applied to the metal at the point where the metal is to be cut. When the metal is red hot, the welder presses the oxygen lever. This applies a stream of pure oxygen to the heated metal. The oxygen combines with the metal in a chemical process called oxidation, which literally burns the metal away. The type of oxidation that occurs when cutting metals is fast oxidation, but slow oxidation is probably more familiar. This is slow oxidation, rust. It's caused by the oxygen in the air combining chemically with the metal. Each of the different jobs a gas welding unit can do requires a different amount of heat. As we said before, welding and cutting demand enough heat to melt the base metal. So, an oxacetylene gas mixture is used. Brazing and soldering, on the other hand, require less heat. So, the acetylene is simply mixed with air drawn from the environment. Okay, now that gives us a basic idea of what a gas welding unit does. But, how does it do it? Well, to understand how a welding unit works, we first have to look at its parts. Typically, an oxacetylene gas welding unit consists of two gas cylinders, one for oxygen and the other for fuel, acetylene. Then a regulator for each cylinder and a welding torch 
and hoses that connect the torch to the cylinders. The unit is made portable by securing it to a wheeled cart that can be moved around freely. Now, let's look at each of these parts in greater detail, starting with the gas cylinders. Here we see a cutaway view of two compressed gas cylinders. The one on the left is an oxygen cylinder. The one on the right is designed to store acetylene. Right away, you can see a big difference between them. The oxygen bottle is a simple, hollow cylinder with a valve assembly on top. When not in use, the valve assembly is covered with a protective cap that screws on to the threads at the top of the cylinder. The acetylene bottle, on the other hand, is quite different. It has the same basic shape as the oxygen cylinder with a similar valve assembly and protective cap. But the acetylene cylinder isn't empty. Filling the inside is a porous material containing a certain amount of acetone. Now, this acetone is important. It absorbs the acetylene and prevents it from exploding in storage. You see, by itself, acetylene is dangerously unstable when under pressures greater than 15 PSI. Inside the cylinder, though, the acetylene is under 250 PSI. Without the acetone to absorb it and hold it in check, the acetylene would literally blow up under normal storage pressure. As you can see, because the acetylene bottle contains the porous material and the acetone, it has a larger diameter than the oxygen cylinder. This difference in size is another way to tell acetylene and oxygen cylinders apart. But let me repeat what I said before. Don't rely on the size or color of a cylinder to tell you what's in it. Always check the label to be sure that you're using the right gas for the job. Well, that pretty well covers the gas cylinders. So now, let's look at the regulators. Regulators do exactly what their name implies. They regulate or control the amount of gas going out through the valves on the cylinders, maintaining a set supply pressure at the torch. Now, although these two regulators look the same, they are not. This is an acetylene regulator. It is designed to handle only the amount of pressure that acetylene is stored under. If you were able to attach this regulator to an oxygen bottle, and then you open the oxygen valve all the way, you'd damage this regulator for sure. Now, to prevent you from accidentally putting a regulator on the wrong bottle, the regulators have different type thread connectors. Okay? Now, Before we connect these regulators to the cylinders, the valves must be cracked open and then closed, allowing a shot of gas to clean the valve. And this is how we do that. Now what I did was open the acetylene valve just long enough to let one good shot of gas escape. This blows any foreign matter out of the valve and proves to me that the valve is clear and gas will flow smoothly. But notice that I uh, first put on my safety goggles. Any gas under pressure is a hazard that can throw dirt, metal bits, or other small particles into your eyes. I can now attach the regulator to the valve. Now, don't try forcing the threads of the regulator to engage the bottle threads. You just ruin the threads on both pieces of equipment. Right away, you should check to be certain that you're putting the right regulator on the cylinder. Remember also not to tighten the regulator too much. There. Your regulator should be secure, but not so tight that you have to break it free using the amount of force that this mechanic is using. Now, when you have one regulator in place, repeat the procedure for the second one. Remove the cap, again, the gas. Now we know that it's free of foreign matter. And we put on the regulator, making sure that it's 
screwed on tightly, but not too tightly so that we damage the threads. Okay. Now, we are ready to connect the hoses to the regulators. Again, you see the color coding scheme, uh, red for acetylene and green for oxygen. But of course, the hoses you use may both be the same color, so to keep them straight, the connectors have different threads and notches in the connector to identify them. Now, the acetylene hose has left-handed threads, and the oxygen hose has right-handed threads, so you can't get the two mixed up. Again, tighten the hoses with enough force to prevent them from leaking at the connection, but don't over-tighten them. That one goes on with the threads going in that direction, right? And this one goes on the oxygen with threads going in the direction that you would normally expect them to go. And it's a good idea to just give it a little jog with the wrench here to make sure that there's no leakage. And of course, on the acetylene, remember that it tightens in the opposite direction. Next, we want to make sure that the hoses are clear of any blockage or foreign matter, so we'll put a shot of gas through both hoses. But hold on for a second. Now, this oxygen bottle is full. Now, that means that the gas inside is under about 2,000 pounds of pressure, and we don't need that much pressure. To make sure the hoses are clear, we need only a few pounds per square inch. So, before opening the oxygen valve, adjust the spring tension on the regulator. Run the screw out until it's loose, and this will prevent any oxygen from flowing through the regulator and hose. Then be sure your eye protection is in place, and uh, get the hose and point it away from you, and then open the valve. Now by tightening the spring tension slightly, you get just enough gas flowing through the hose to be sure that it's clear. And you can hear it. Now, after a second or so, shut the oxygen valve. And then repeat the procedure for the acetylene system. We turn the adjustment screw until it's loose. Then we open the valve. Then we turn the adjustment screw in again we're still holding the hoses away from us, and we hear the gas for just a couple of seconds. We loosen the adjustment screw, we close the valve, and finally, we're ready to connect the hoses to the torch. Now, like the other parts of the unit, the threads on the torch are left-handed for acetylene, and right-handed for oxygen. So there's no confusing them. And so we apply the acetylene to that side, the oxygen turning the other way to this side, just to make sure that there is no leakage. We give them a turn with the wrench and there we have it. The welding rig is fully assembled and ready to be put to work. But before we see the procedure for lighting the torch and then disassembling the unit after a job, turn off the tape and uh, work through segment two in your text. Your instructor will answer any questions you have up to this point. In the last segment, we looked briefly at the parts of the oxacetylene gas welding rig and the procedure for assembling them. And now, the unit is ready for the mechanic. Now, the first thing he does is to start the flow of gases from the cylinder to the torch. 
Uh, just as we did when blowing gas through the hoses, he makes sure that all spring tension is off the regulator, and then he cracks the valve. Now immediately, the gauge on the right registers the amount of pressure in the cylinder. As the mechanic adjusts the regulator to let gas into the hose, the gauge on the left, which indicates the amount of pressure in the hose, begins to register pressure. The mechanic continues to adjust the spring until this gauge reads 5 PSI, the right amount of acetylene pressure for operation. And then he repeats the procedure for the oxygen. Now, you can see here that the pressure in the oxygen bottle is much higher than that in an acetylene bottle. And when he adjusts the spring, he sets the oxygen pressure to the torch to about 40 PSI. Now we're ready for the safety gear. That means first the goggles, and then the gloves. Now, he's ready to light the torch. Usually, acetylene is fed through the torch first by opening the acetylene valve. Then a striker is used to create a spark and ignite the gas. The oxygen valve can then be opened slowly and oxygen fed through the torch until the flame is the right intensity for the job you're doing. By the way, always use a striker to light a torch. Using matches or a lighter is a foolish risk that can give you a lot more fire than you need. When the job is finished, you'll want to shut the flame down. This is done by first closing the acetylene valve and cutting off the fuel supply. Then close the oxygen valve. In many cases, you won't have to disassemble the unit, but here we're going to demonstrate the disassembly procedure. The first step is to shut the valves on both cylinders. This cuts off the flow of gases to the torch. But remember, the hoses are still full of gas. This gas has to be bled off before you disconnect anything. This is done by opening both valves on the torch all the way and allowing the gas to escape. The regulator will automatically open as it tries to maintain the pressure setting. We can now start the actual disassembly procedure by disconnecting the torch from the hoses. Now, if you had to uncoil the hoses to do the job, make sure you coil them up neatly again to keep them in good condition and prevent them from getting knotted or twisted. Then, the hoses are disconnected from their regulators. First the acetylene and then the oxygen. Next, remove both regulators by disconnecting them from the cylinder valve assemblies. Now when you set the regulators aside, pick a safe place where they won't get banged around or be in anybody's way. These regulators are delicate instruments and should be handled with special care. Now once the regulators are disconnected, the only thing left is to put the protective caps on both cylinders. This is very important because any damage to the valves could end in a cylinder rupture that could cause serious injury and severe damage. Well, we've now seen a typical gas welding unit assembled, tested for leaks, lit, and finally disassembled. And you should have a basic understanding of how the parts of the unit work together. But before you can go out and use a unit like this one, 
you need more detailed understanding of how each part works. It's an important part of your job to know as much as possible about the equipment you use. So turn off the tape now and use your text to review the material we've just covered. In the next segment, we'll look more closely at the design and function of a gas welding unit and learn the proper way to care for the equipment. We've already seen the procedure for assembling, lighting, and disassembling a basic oxacetylene gas welding unit. But as I mentioned at the close of the last segment, there are several features of the equipment that we haven't discussed yet. And we haven't said anything about many of the safety and maintenance procedures involved in working with welding rigs. So for the next few minutes, let's go back and add some detail to what we've already found out about gas welding equipment. Again, let's start with the oxygen cylinder. We've already seen that oxygen cylinders are hollow and that the flow of gas is controlled by a valve at the top of the cylinder. But a close look at an oxygen cylinder valve shows us that the system also has a fusible safety plug covered by a safety cap and disc. Now the plug is called a fusible plug because it's designed to fuse or melt when temperatures reach a certain level. During a fire, for example, when the oxygen inside the bottle begins to heat up, the fusible plug will melt and the safety cap will pop off, releasing the gas from the cylinder. This prevents the stored oxygen from ever heating up and expanding enough to rupture the cylinder. The acetylene cylinder also has a fusible safety plug in its valve assembly. Uh, and as an added precaution, most acetylene cylinders have several additional fusible plugs in the bottom of the cylinder. Well, that finishes up as much as we need to know about the gas cylinders. So let's look at the next component of a gas welding unit, the regulators. Now, as we discussed earlier, the regulator maintains a set supply pressure at the torch. During the assembly and lighting procedures, we learned that the acetylene regulator and the oxygen regulator are not interchangeable. For one thing, the threads on the acetylene regulator are left-handed, while those on the oxygen system are right-handed. We also saw that each regulator has two gauges. Now, the gauge on the right of each regulator tells us how much gas pressure there is in each cylinder. The other gauge gives us a reading of hose pressure or regulator outlet pressure. Finally, we talked about the adjusting screw. Now when run all the way out, a valve inside the regulator is held shut and blocks the flow of gas. Adjusting the screw the other way gradually opens the flow path through the regulator. Now to understand exactly how the adjusting screw and spring mechanism operate, Let's look at this cutaway of a typical single stage regulator. The valve on the cylinder connects here and the hose connects to the regulator outlet here. We can also see the adjusting screw and the spring. And the spring is directly connected to the valve and a rubber diaphragm seals the valve preventing gas from escaping into the spring chamber. Now, when the adjusting screw is run out all the way, tension on the spring is relieved and the gas pressure in the cylinder pushes against the valve closing off its own escape but as the adjusting screw is run in it puts pressure on the spring and of course the valve as the screw is adjusted inward more and more pressure is exerted on the spring and valve until it overcomes the pressure in the cylinder the valve opens and the gas flows through the regulator and into the hose. As the pressure in the hose increases, it acts against the diaphragm and spring. When the supply pressure reaches the desired level, it forces the valve into a closed or partially opened position. Then when the adjusting screw is run out again, the cylinder pressure overcomes the spring tension and the valve closes. 
Well, now that you've seen what's inside regulators like these, you can appreciate how delicate they are. Their mechanisms can't take a lot of banging around, so treat them carefully, because your safety and the safe operation of the rig itself depend on the regulators working properly. And to avoid regulator problems, follow these three rules. First, use them properly. Be certain to put the right regulator on the cylinder. Make sure you run the adjusting screw out before cracking the valve on the cylinder. And don't forget to adjust the screw so that your torch is getting the right amount of gas. Usually about five PSI, but never more than 15 PSI of acetylene and around 40 PSI of oxygen. The gas pressures will depend upon the type of work to be performed. But don't depend on your pressure staying where you set it for during the entire job. Check the gauges occasionally while you work and make whatever adjustments are necessary to keep the regulator outlet pressure at the right level. Outlet pressure may vary with bottle pressure or when flame adjustments are made. Now the second rule is, if the unit develops gas pressure problems, immediately stop and try to find the cause. Get in the habit of making regular leak checks. And when you find a loose connection, tighten it. But if nothing you try seems to solve your pressure problems, you have no other choice than to shut the rig down, disassemble it, and replace the regulator. Now, don't try to repair a regulator yourself, though. The faulty regulator should be checked and serviced by a mechanic certified for regulator repairs. Finally, our third rule is never oil a regulator. Any oil that gets into a regulator, especially an oxygen regulator, could cause an explosion that will blow the regulator apart. If regulator lubrication is necessary, use glycerin or soap, never oil. So for your own safety and the safety of the equipment you're working with, it's wise to leave regulator repair and maintenance to people who are certified and know what they're doing. Tinkering with equipment used with flammable and explosive gases is no way to have a long and successful career as a mechanic. OK, now we know something about regulators, how they operate, and a few basic rules to follow when working with them. But what about the hoses that carry the gases from the cylinders to the torch? Now the hoses are one of the most abused parts of a welding rig. All too often you'll see inexperienced welders and helpers run out their gas hoses without a heck of a lot of common sense. They uh, run them across traffic lanes and directly under places where the other welders are working. Uh, they fail to keep the hoses clear of equipment. And they're even careless about keeping their own flame pointed the other way. And then when the job is finished, they coil the hoses without any concern for them at all. Well, what these people forget is that these hoses carry flammable and explosive gases. And if they're damaged in any way, the gases can escape, presenting a very serious safety hazard. And it doesn't take much to cut the soft, flexible material that these hoses are made of. So here again, we have some basic rules to follow. First, always inspect your hoses before starting any job. Cuts, cracking, other signs of weaknesses are all good reasons for getting a replacement hose. Second, keep the cylinders at a safe distance from where you're cutting or welding, but place them as close to your work as possible. This prevents you from having to run your hoses across long spaces where there's a greater chance of their being damaged. Third, keep your hoses away from hot steam pipes and open flames and other heat sources that can melt holes into them. Next, choose a route for your hoses that keeps them clear of equipment, especially equipment that runs hot and out of the way of vehicle and personnel traffic. Fifth. Keep your hoses free of kinks and twisting that could restrict the gas flow to your torch. And when you're welding or cutting above the level of your gas supply, secure your hose to a railing or other safe place. 
This prevents the weight of the hose from pulling the torch out of your hand and prevents the hose from slipping over the edge. But finally, when you finish the job, store the hoses properly. A neat coil, free of kinks and twisted sections, is some of the best care that you can give hoses you work with. Well, so far we've covered the gas cylinders, regulators, and hoses. But before we talk about the different types of torches you might work with, take this opportunity to discuss the material covered so far with your instructor and read segment four of your text. In this segment, there are two types of torches or blowpipes that we want to talk about. Cutting torches, like this one, and welding torches. Right away, we can notice two differences between them. First, the cutting torch has a tip angled at 90 degrees from the handle, while the tip of the welding torch is set at a much wider angle from the handle. Second, a cutting torch has a lever attached to the handle, while a welding torch does not. These differences are important because they determine what each torch can do. Well, let's assemble a welding torch. Now the welding torch has two valves at the base of the handle. Now one controls the flow of acetylene and the other the flow of oxygen. And these gases are mixed as they flow through the nozzle and are ignited at the tip. By adjusting the valves, the mixture of the gases can be changed to produce the right size and intensity of flame for the job you're doing. Now there are two ways that welding torches mix the gases fed into them. One is the medium or equal pressure method, and the other is the injection method. This drawing shows a typical medium or equal pressure torch head. In this type of torch, the gases enter a mixing chamber at equal pressures. Inside the chamber, the gases mix before going out through the tip where they are ignited. Now in contrast, here's a cutaway view of an injection or high pressure torch head. As you can see, there is no mixing chamber. Instead, oxygen enters the torch at high pressure. This oxygen flows through a restriction called a venturi that increases the velocity of the gas as it flows through it. And just before entering the tip, the oxygen is flowing with so much force that it literally draws the acetylene out with it. So in an injector torch, the gases aren't mixed until they actually reach the nozzle. Well, throughout this unit, we've mentioned the torch tip, the part of the torch that delivers the gases to be ignited. For the purpose of this discussion, we can categorize welding torch tips into three general sizes, small, medium, and large. Tips are numbered to indicate their sizes, but numbering systems vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. Now, this is a small tip used for welding sheet metal up to an eighth of an inch thick. This is a medium tip. It's an all-purpose size that can be used on metal up to about a quarter inch in thickness. The large size is used on thick metals and in jobs where extremely high temperatures are required. Now, all of these tips are made to be replaceable. Tips for injector-type torches, however, must be replaced along with the injector itself. The tip and torch to be used for a job will be selected by the welder. However, as a welder's assistant, you'll have the responsibility for keeping a variety of different size tips clean and on hand for the welder to choose from. Now, there are three things to remember when changing or handling tips. First, never try to change a hot tip. Heat expands the metal, virtually locking the tip in place. And trying to free a hot tip from a torch will probably end up in damaging both parts. Second, always use the proper tool when removing a tip. Never use pliers. Pliers will round off the connector nuts, making them useless. When you install a new tip, install it finger tight. Don't tighten it with a wrench. The tip isn't designed to be put on that way. 
Third, to clean any tip, use a tip cleaner. A tip cleaner is designed to do the job without damaging the metal. Now you can keep the outside surface of the tip clean and smooth by occasionally using fine sandpaper on it. Okay, that covers welding torches and tips. Now, what about cutting torches? Well, let's put one together. We can use the same handle as we did on the welding torch because they are interchangeable. Now, again, we find that these two valves right here control oxygen and acetylene just as they did on the welding torch, but there is a difference. The acetylene is opened to adjust the flame, that's this one, but this time the oxygen is opened all the way. The oxygen to the flame is adjusted by this valve, which was not found on the welding torch. The lever feeds pure oxygen to the torch. Now, as we already pointed out, the tip of a cutting torch is angled at 90 degrees to the handle. Now, when depressed, this lever greatly increases the flow of oxygen. Now, let's see why this lever is important when cutting metals. Here, the welder is about to make a straight cut in a piece of plate steel. He starts by heating the starting point. Then, he depresses the lever and the blast of pure oxygen causes the metal to burn. By keeping the lever depressed, he can move the torch along, cutting the metal by melting and burning the material out of the way. You can see then that the lever on a cutting torch serves an important function. Well, we should also take a close look at the tip of a cutting torch. Unlike the welding tips we saw, cutting tips have several holes or orifices. The hole in the center feeds out that blast of oxygen we talked about just a moment ago, while the orifices around the outside are preheat orifices that supply the gas mixture to the flame. Like the welding tips we saw, cutting tips should be kept clean by using a tip cleaner and occasionally some fine sandpaper. Well, so far we've looked at the two different types of torches, welding and cutting torches. And we saw the differences between equal pressure and injection type welding torch heads. We also talked a little bit about the types of tips that you might encounter and how they should be cared for. Well, that's a lot of information. So turn off the tape, read through segment five of your text, and review the material thoroughly. Now that we've gotten an idea of how a gas welding unit operates, it's time to look at how this equipment is used. We mentioned earlier that gas welding can be used for a variety of jobs, from simply heating metal parts to cutting, welding, brazing, and soldering. We've already seen the basic cutting process. Using a cutting torch, the welder first heats the area to be cut away, in this case, a small section in a steel plate. When the metal becomes sufficiently hot, he depresses the oxygen lever, burning and blowing the material out of the way. An important thing to remember when cutting and when working around others who are cutting is to stay clear of flying molten metal. Always wear your eye, head, and skin protection. We also talked a little about the gas welding process. In welding, the metal parts to be joined are heated until their edges begin to melt and flow together. A filler rod is melted gradually into the seam between the base metal pieces to supply additional metal to the bond. The finished weld is actually as strong as the base metal itself. Earlier, we pointed out that brazing is a slightly different process from welding. In brazing, the metal to be joined is heated but not melted. A filler rod dipped in flux is then melted into the space between the base metal pieces. So actually, the metal from the rod is used to bond the base metal together. As you can see, care must be taken not to apply the flame long enough to melt the base metal or consume the rod too quickly. 
Now, silver soldering and silver brazing are very similar to the brazing process we just saw. In the demonstration you'll see in a moment, however, the welder will use an air acetylene rig instead of an oxacetylene rig. An air acetylene rig requires only one gas cylinder, the fuel cylinder, since the air in the environment is used to form the gas mixture. Now acetylene enters the air acetylene torch here, and its flow is controlled by the valve on the handle. The acetylene flows through the torch with enough pressure to draw air into the torch so that what comes out of the tip is the proper mixture of air and acetylene. Anytime you silver braze, the first step is to clean the base metal surfaces. In this case, we'll be soldering copper tubing, and an emery or crocus cloth is used to remove all dirt, film, and oxidation. Then, the tubing is assembled, and the joints to be soldered are heated until red. But when the base metal is the right temperature, the silver filler rod is touched to the joint and permitted to melt flowing into the joint to form a bond. Well, that covers the basic uses of a gas welding unit. Cutting, welding, brazing, and silver soldering. We've also had a chance to look at the way an air acetylene torch operates. But there's a lot more to operating a welding unit properly than what we've seen in this unit. Your text and your instructor can give you additional information. But a thorough working knowledge of the equipment will only come with experience. So as you assist the welders in your plant, pay attention to how they do their job. Their expertise will be a valuable tool in helping you to work with gas welding safely and to develop your own skills.